Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to another episode of Golondrinas Live Sessions. I'm Laura Gonzalez, Manager of Education and Volunteers here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas, Santa Fe's premier living history museum, located out in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley. Joining us today to share some insight into the Civil War in New Mexico is Las Golondrinas Board Chair, Henry Rivera. In addition to his service to Las Golondrinas, Henry is, is an internationally recognized communications lawyer, author, speaker, and conference leader. A former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, he has been named one of the District of Columbia's super lawyers, among the best lawyers in America in communications law, and among the top 12 telecom experts in the United States. He is a partner in the Washington DC firm of Wiley Ryan and a native New Mexican who obtained both his BA and JD from the University of New Mexico. He also holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration degree from the University of Albuquerque. He has a passion for history, particularly the US Civil War and is a member of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. His topic today is the Confederate invasion of the New Mexico Territory, which explores events leading up to the American Civil War in the West and the reasoning behind Jefferson Davis's decision to authorize the 1862 Confederate invasion of New Mexico. For an optimal viewing experience during this presentation, please adjust your volume on your viewing devices as well as the video screen itself. And please post any questions for Henry in the comments section and he'll address them at the end of his talk. And now it is my pleasure to welcome once again, Board Chair Henry Rivera. Well, thank you for that generous introduction, Laura. Um, so, uh, Vic, I think we can go ahead with the first slide. This talk uh, deals with the 1861 Confederate invasion of the New Mexico Territory, as Laura just mentioned. The uh, invasion was executed exclusively by Texas troops, known as the Army of New Mexico and the Sibley Brigade. The Army initially consisted of the 4th, 5th, and 7th Texas Mounted Volunteers, plus artillery, and when it entered uh, New Mexico from San Antonio, Texas in December of 1861, they added six, six companies of the second Texas, which had entered Southern uh, New Mexico in July of 1861 to secure Fort Bliss at El Paso and its military supplies for the Confederacy. This campaign was the uh, second smallest of the war in terms of uh, combatants and resulted in two major battles in New Mexico. The first was Valverde, the largest, with a total engaged of 5,540 troops, 3,000 Federals suffering 263 casualties, and 2,540 Confederates suffering 187 casualties. And the second was Glorieta, the defining battle of the New Mexico campaign, with a total engaged of 2,640 troops, 1,300 Federals, uh, 300 Federals suffering 147 casualties, and 1,340 Confederates suffering 222 casualties. These figures are best estimates because it's difficult to obtain accurate Confederate troop numbers. The first battle, Valverde, was fought to capture Fort Cray, which was one of the largest and most important military posts in the Southwest. It was also fought to clear Union troops off the Confederate path north and their supply line back to Texas. Fort Craig was established to protect travelers on the Camino Real from Apaches. As we will discuss in a moment, the supplies at Fort Craig and other federal forts were essential to the Confederates to prosecute the New Mexico campaign. The second battle, Glorieta, was simply a meeting engagement. There was no particular reason for the two sides to have fought there. These battles ended with the Confederates in possession of the field and so are considered by most to be Confederate tactical victories. However, during the Battle of Glorieta, Union troops succeeded in getting in the Confederate rear and destroying all of their weapons and the, their contents and scattering their draft animals. The, the result was that the Confederates had no am ammunition, food, or forage for the remaining animals and no other supplies with which to prosecute their campaign. Glorieta, secured the Western frontier for the Union and ended what was a bold venture 
for the Confederacy that had great potential. Having accomplished nothing, the Confederates returned to Texas in April of 1862. They left almost 1,000 troops in New Mexico in graves, hospitals, and POW camps. Just a footnote here, my great-grandfather, that's three greats, fought for the Union in both battles as a second lieutenant, 3rd New Mexico Volunteer Mounted Infantry. His name was John Dalton, an Irishman born in County Mead. He's buried in the National Cemetery in Santa Fe. We can have the next slide. We need to digress for just a moment to talk about the 1846-1848 war with Mexico. The occupation of Mexico City in September of 1847 ended the military phase of the war, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed in February of 1848, officially ended it. The treaty expanded the United States territory by 525,000 square miles, or 40%. Two years after the Mexican War, the Compromise of 1850 created the New Mexico and Utah Territories. The New Mexico Territory was huge, encompassing today's New Mexico, Arizona, and parts of Nevada and Colorado. We can have the uh, map, please. Next slide. Now, turning to our Civil War, I think it's fair to say that the war in the Southwest borderlands is the least understood part of the war. I have encountered serious students of the war who are very surprised to learn that Civil War battles took place here. This afternoon, I hope to shed a little light on the war in this part of the world, but I'm not going to focus on the military aspects of the invasion, including the battles that took place, but rather my focus is on why the invasion occurred, and in particular, why Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederacy, personally authorized it. And for purposes of our conversation, it's important to note he did personally authorize it. In other words, I'm going to try to get into Davis's head to determine what was going on in there when he gave the green light to the New Mexico campaign. Next slide, please. The answer to the question of why Davis sanctioned this campaign is complex, involving the Mexican War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the history of the thorny relationship between New Mexico and Texas, and the Compromise of 1850. And why should answering this question be of uh, any interest? Because the New Mexico Territory in 1862 was a sparsely populated backwater with little or no resources for the Confederacy. Moreover, the newly formed Confederacy was about to be seriously engaged militarily with the federal government in the vastly more populated and important Eastern Theater and Trans-Mississippi. What possessed Jeff Davis to commit federal uh, Confederate troops and resources on a campaign to conquer and occupy New Mexico? In addition to organizing the Confederacy's war effort, he had just moved the, the Confederacy's capital from Montgomery to Richmond in May and was in the midst of uh, organizing his cabinet and the new government of the Confederacy, all of which is to say he had a lot on his plate. So why the New Mexico campaign? Next slide, please. The Confederate soldier who conceived, organized, and executed the invasion was General uh, Henry Hopkins Sibley. We can have the photograph. And here's a photograph of him. Now we can go back to this. On December 20, 1861, after his army had entered New Mexico, Sibley issued a proclamation taking possession of New Mexico in the name of the Confederate States. He called on the citizens of New Mexico to abandon their allegiance to the Union and to join the Confederacy. Ominously, he warned that those who cooperate with the enemy will be treated accordingly and must be prepared to share their fate. Sibley was 44 at the time and prior to the Civil War had served as a major of dragoons in New Mexico and briefly commanded at Fort Union, New Mexico. He had a reputation of being difficult, insubordinate, impossible to deal with, and he was given to volcanic outbursts of anger. Fort Union, located in northeastern New Mexico, was Sibley's strategic objective for the New Mexico campaign. It was the largest Union supply depot in the southwest and the linchpin of defense on the Santa Fe Trail. Capturing Fort Union was essential to the success of the Confederate live off the land element of the New Mexico campaign, which I will get to in a minute. 
Sibley resigned his commission in the Union Army to fight for the Confederacy in May of 1861. He was West Point, class of 1838, a Mexican War veteran, and the inventor of the Sibley tent and stove, both of which were widely used by the Union Army during the Civil War. He was also a functional alcoholic, known behind his back as the walking whiskey keg and one of the worst generals in the Confederate Army. He was not present on the field at either the Battle of Valverde or Glorieta. Both battles were managed by subordinates. At Valverde, it is said he was indisposed because he was drunk. At Glorieta, he was in Albuquerque, 75 miles from the battlefield. After the war, he went to Egypt, uh, and he was a general in the Khedive of Egypt's army. By 1873, the Khedive fed up with his drunken incompetence, dismissed him from the army. He returned to Fredericksburg, Virginia, to live with his daughter. He died in 1886, a penniless alcoholic, and he's buried in Fredericksburg's Con Confederate Cemetery. However, the troops that he raised were examples of the best volunteers answering the Southern call to arms during 1861, and with few exceptions, they became excellent soldiers during the New Mexico campaign. Next slide, please. As you know, the Civil War began in April of 1861, and not long after, in July of 1861, Sibley traveled from Texas to Richmond to meet with Davis to pitch his idea for the invasion of New Mexico and to obtain Davis's authorization to raise an army for the purpose of conquering and occupying New Mexico. And Davis is very interested. In making his pitch, Sibley's task, therefore, is not to persuade Davis of the wisdom of conquering and occupying New Mexico, but rather it is to convince him that it, it will be easy. In other words, that Davis's investment of the South's scarce resources in the campaign would be slight compared to the substantial return he stood to gain. Sibley told Davis that he knew New Mexico well because he served there before the war and commanded at Fort Union, the most important federal po post in the New Mexico Territory. What Sibley did not know, however, is that since his time at Fort Union, the fort had been moved and redesigned. During the New Mexico campaign, Sibley did not reach Fort Union, but had he, he would have been very surprised. During his tour of duty in New Mexico, Sibley naturally acquired a great deal of information concerning New Mexico's resources, the condition of the federal army, the amount of military supplies located here, the attitude of the local population toward the Confederacy, and other pertinent information. He told Davis, that the Southwest offered the Confederacy a gigantic recruiting ground. From its population of 86,000, New Mexico alone could field a small army. Sibley told Davis that there was much sympathy for the South among the New Mexico population. For example, Anglos in southern New Mexico had for some time sought to separate themselves from the alien pop population, and here you should read Hispanic, of Santa Fe in the North, in order to create a new territory out of the southern part of New Mexico. Bills were even introduced in Congress to accomplish that, but were rejected. In April of 1860, delegates to a convention in Tucson declared all of New Mexico south of 33 degrees, essentially south of Socorro, to be henceforth the territory of Arizona, and a fellow by the name of Lewis Owings was elected governor. Texas seceded in February of 1861 and joined the Confederacy in March of 1861. When Texas joined the Confederacy, Southern New Mexico passed resolutions also joining the Confederacy. Next slide, please. As I noted earlier, on July 25, 1861, Colonel John Baylor and the 2nd Texas moved into West Texas and Southern New Mexico to take possession of Fort Bliss. They then occupied Mesilla without incident. On August 1st, 1861, Baylor proclaimed all of New Mexico south of 33 degrees to be the Confederate territory of Arizona. He appointed himself governor and proclaimed Mesilla as its capital. Confederate Arizona is a very large area because it encompassed all of the territory south of 33 degrees that lies between the Texas and California borders. Now, facilitating the creation of Confederate Arizona was the fact that the commander of the Union Military Department of New Mexico, Colonel Stephen Canby, 
In contemplation of a Confederate invasion of New Mexico from Texas, in early 1862 had ordered his troops garrisoning forts in what is today's Arizona to withdraw and concentrate along the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico. There were very few roads connecting Texas with New Mexico, and only two that could support a military campaign. Once Sibley committed his army to access New Mexico by the Rio Grande Valley, that is where Canby concentrated his troops. The Arizona forts abandoned by the Union troops were established mainly to protect settlers from attacks by Apaches. After they were abandoned, there were no federal troops in the Arizona portion of the New Mexico Territory to impede the Confederacy's acquisition of that part of the New Mexico Territory necessary to create Confederate Arizona. All of which is to say that there is already Confederate interest in at least part of the New Mexico Territory when Sibley makes his pitch to Davis. Next slide, please. Sibley also told Davis that notwithstanding Union troop redeployments from Arizona uh, into the Rio Grande Valley, the Union Army's presence in New Mexico is thin and inefficient, and therefore it could be easily defeated. There is some truth to Sibley's assertion because there were not a lot of Union troops in New Mexico, and Colonel Canby had sent to Kansas, Colorado, and California for reinforcements. Moreover, many Union officers elected to fight for the Confederacy. Therefore, many Union troops in New Mexico were without officers, so that morale among Union un units was low. Therefore, Sibley believed Union troops in New Mexico were vulnerable to a concerted effort by a fresh Confederate army. Next slide, please. Sibley also believed the native New Mexico population would come to his aid, or at the very least not impede his mission. He was seriously mistaken about that because the native New Mexico population remembered well prior attempts by Texas to acquire New Mexico and saw this new invasion by Texas troops as just another such attempt. It is worth noting that there was very little appreciation by the locals of the larger civil war or its implications for New Mexico. But due to prior invasion attempts by Texans, there was a viscerally negative opinion of Texans such that New Mexicans were willing to volunteer and fight against such an invasion. This negativity toward Texans was so pervasive among New Mexicans that Texans became a boogeyman that parents used to secure behavioral compliance from their children. The Texans will get you, those misbehaving were told. Next slide, please. Sibley's most persuasive selling point to Davis was that the Army of New Mexico could live off the land and would not need to be supplied by the Confederacy once it entered New Mexico. This is because Sibley believed he could easily capture key federal forts, including Fort Union, which, as I noted earlier, was essential to the success of his entire campaign because it was the largest and best supplied federal outpost in New Mexico and indeed the entire Southwest. At Fort Union, readily available, would be supplies for his men, forage for his animals, and military hardware. Therefore, after being equipped and supplied in San Antonio, Texas, Sibley's army would obtain all other necessary war material from the defeated Federal Army. Hence, Sibley tells Davis his investment in the campaign would be small, but the potential returns huge. In addition to being mistaken about support from the local population, Sibley was also badly mistaken about the ability of his army to live off the land and off supplies at captured federal forts. His failure to appreciate this fact and properly deal with the logistic issues of food for his men, forage for his animals, and ammunition for his rifles and artillery doomed the campaign from the start. Next slide, please. Sibley also had much bigger plans for his New Mexico campaign that involved the entire West and Mexico. His ultimate goal was the conquest of California and the annexation of northern Mexico. He believed that after New Mexico had been occupied, his army, of course swelled by recruits, would move on to conquer California, its warm water ports, and gold fields. Conquest of California would give the South a Pacific coastline of over 1,200 miles and the ports of Los Angeles and San Diego, which could break the blockade of rebel ports in the east 
since the U.S. Navy in 1862 was barely capable of effectively blockading the Confederacy's eastern, eastern ports. Sibley also believed that once the conquest of California was accomplished, the Confederacy would open negotiations with Mexico to secure Chihuahua, Sonora, and Baja California, either by purchase or conquest. The resulting Confederate state slave empire would extend the length of the continent and into Mexico. We know of Sibley's grand plan for the New Mexico, New Mexico campaign because one of his officers, Trevanian Teal, stated this was indeed Sibley's vision revealed to him by Sibley in a private conversation. Did Sibley share this grandiose vision for the New Mexico campaign with President Davis? And if so, did Davis buy into it? We don't know. There is no record that he did, and Davis's order to Sibley do not indicate this larger vision. The orders are brief and read, Sir, in view of your recent service in New Mexico and knowledge of that country and the people, the President has entrusted you with the important duty of driving the federal troops from that department and at the same time securing all the arms and materials of war. The New Mexico campaign is the only Confederate campaign whose intent was to conquer and occupy Union territory. It is one of the few winter campaigns. It can get very cold in our mountains in March when the Battle of Glorieta was fought. The elevation there is about 7,400 feet. As to that part of Sibley's vision having to do with the annexation of parts of Mexico, we do know that Richmond was not interested, at least while the Civil War was in progress. Next slide, please. So let's be honest. This vision for the New Mexico campaign, promoted by a functional alcoholic, seems pretty harebrained, particularly in view of the fact that the Confederacy was already engaged in the war and was about to be even more heavily engaged. Recall that First Bull Run was fought in July of 1861. Fort Donelson would fall in February of 1862. McClellan's Peninsula campaign would begin in, on March 23rd, and the Battle of Shiloh was looming in April. Assuming Davis was not interested in pursuing Sibley's grandiose campaign, or grandiose vision of the New Mexico campaign, is it reasonable to assume that Richmond would be content simply to occupy New Mexico for the rest of the war? Maybe. But note that with the fall of New Mexico, the way to California would be open, and a move toward California would be the likely next step for either Sibley's or some other Confederate troops. And it needs to be said that had Sibley achieved his vision for the campaign, the impact on the war would have been immense. The total land area controlled by the Confederacy would have doubled. The Confederacy would have access to the gold and silver uh, to purchase arms and ammunition. And it might have caused the UK and France to recognize the Confederacy. That said, assuming a favorable outcome to the New Mexico campaign, could Sibley have moved on to conquer and occupy California? I think not. Given the formation of what became known as the California Column under the command of uh, General James Carlington, Carlton of Bosque Redondo fame, and the movement of that column from California to New Mexico in August of 1862 to support Union efforts against Sibley. As noted earlier, Sibley's army had returned to Texas in April so the California column arrived in New Mexico too late to have any impact on Sibley's Army of New Mexico. I believe that Davis would indeed have been content simply to, to bring New Mexico into the Confederacy and not to move on California. Next slide, please. To examine this thesis, we need to begin examining Texas' attitude toward New Mexico in 1840, the year of the first invasion of New Mexico by the then Republic of Texas. At that time, New Mexico was part of Mexico. The 1840 invasion was unsuccessful. What prompted Texas to invade New Mexico? Well, it was trade along the Santa Fe Trail because it was worth millions each year and Texas wanted to tax it. Texas was burdened by a $10 million debt equal to approximately $314 million in today's dollars as a result of its 1836 War of Independence uh, against Mexico, and it was searching for revenue sources to pay off that debt. The trail did not go through Texas, so it occurred to Texas that it could acquire the trail by acquiring New Mexico. 
of course, home to the Santa Fe, to Santa Fe and the end of the, uh, of the trail. The following year, the Republic of Texas tried again to acquire New Mexico and the trail in another failed invasion attempt. Members of the 1841 Texas Ex Expeditionary Force were captured by the Mexican Army and sent to Mexico City in chains. Many Texans who joined Sibley's 1861 invasion remembered the ignominy suffered by these captives and harbored a serious grudge against New Mexicans because of it. In 1845, Texas was admitted to the Union as a slave state, and in a repeat effort to gain access to, the, to trade along the Santa Fe Trail, Texas claimed the Rio Grande as its southern and western borders, and a strip north to what is today Montana's southern border. Can we have the next slide, please? Despite being defeated in Texas' War of Independence, Mexico denied Texas independence and vigorously disputed Texas' claim that the Rio Grande was its border. Instead, Mexico claimed the Rio Nueces, some 200 miles east of the Rio Grande, was its border with the United States. In March of 1848, Texas sent a fellow by the name of Spruce Baird to New Mexico to enforce Texas' claims over New Mexico. Not surprisingly, he met stiff resistance, both from New Mexico and federal authorities, including President Zachary Taylor. Next slide, please. At this juncture, it's important to step back from the issues surrounding the New Mexico-Texas relationship to look at the national picture. As a result of the Texas annex annexation in 1845 by the United States, Mexico and the United States were at war. Between 1846 and 1848, at the end of military op operations against Mexico in September of 1847, the Union was made up of 15 free and 15 slave states. And because of this 50-50 split in the U.S. Senate, the South had a virtual veto over any law threatening slavery. Control of the Senate was crucial for the South to preserve the, pe the peculiar institution because by 1847, Southern po uh, power in the House of Representatives had waned significantly. The population in the North had swelled, partially due to European immigrants settling in the free states. These immigrants favored the free states because they did not have to compete with slave, the slave labor of the South for jobs. At the country's founding, the South insisted on the inclusion of the, in the Constitution of the Three-Fifths Clause, which allowed slave owners to count three-fifths of their slaves for the purpose of congressional representation. This is Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution. The three-fifths clause notwithstanding, the North's swelling population gave the North unrivaled control of the House. Tying the South's need to control the Senate to post-Mexican War New Mexico, if any of the territory obtained from Mexico after the war, referred to as the Mexican Cession, entered the Union as a free state, of course, the South's ability to veto anti-slavery laws in the Senate ceases. The South's fear in this regard are well-founded because the Wilmot Proviso, passed twice in the House after the Mexican War, prohibited slavery in the entire Mexican session. Of course, the terms of the Wilmot Proviso are never passed in the Senate, but it represented a dire warning of what the South would face if it ever lost the 50-50 split in the Senate. The South adopted a simple strategy to maintain the 50-50 split in the Senate, admit no new states from the Mexican session. The problem with this strategy is that in January of 1848, gold is discovered in California. This is a game changer because with the withdrawal of Mexico from California after the Mexican War, there is practically speaking no government or law in California, which means there is no way to protect property rights, including mining claims. Discovery of gold made it imperative that California be admitted as a state so that U.S. law could be established and property rights, including mining claims, could be protected. The problem for the South was that California wanted to join the Union as a free state, thus ending the 50-50 split in the Senate. The Southern states decided they were willing to admit California as a free state so long as they got something in return. This gives rise to the Compromise of 1850, which, as I mentioned above, created the New Mexico and Utah territories and admitted California as a free state. In exchange, the South got a more uh, stringent fugitive slave law, 
popular sovereignty, which gave the, the people in New Mexico and Utah the right to decide if they would be free or slave, as opposed to Congress making that decision. And importantly for our investigation of why Jefferson Davis was keen on Confederate control of New Mexico, the Texas boundary question, including its claims on the ter New Mexico territory to the Rio Grande, were settled. Texas gave up its claim to New Mexico territory in exchange for assumption by the federal government of its debt. This was an enormous win for Texas because, as I mentioned earlier, it had a $10 million debt as a result of its war of independence with Mexico. We can have the next slide. The Compromise of 1850 was adopted in September. Backing up a few months to July of 1850, President uh, Taylor died, and his vice president, Millard Fillmore, assumed the presidency. Fillmore told Texas that, like Taylor, he was prepared to send tr U.S. troops to New Mexico to defend the integrity of its territorial borders if Texas troops invaded New Mexico for purposes of enforcing its Rio Grande border claims. Many southern states lined up behind Texas and vowed to support its claims on New Mexico territory, including sending troops to do so. Why? Because New Mexico wanted to join the Union as a free state. Therefore, as startling as that may seem, as of July of 1850, the country was on the verge of civil war, and the war could easily have started in Santa Fe instead of Charleston Harbor. The September 1850 Compromise averted civil war and the Union was preserved for another 11 years. However, because, of the comp because the Compromise required Texas to give up its claim to New Mexico territory, many in Texas and the South <clears throat> felt at least part of New Mexico was stolen from Texas, and additional slave territory was stolen from the South. Next slide, please. So what does all this have to do with Jefferson Davis and why he authorized Sibley's invasion of New Mexico? He was a senator from Mississippi during the extensive congressional debate on the Compromise of 1850. He was a hardliner, consistently voting against the Compromise. Like many others of the Southern planter class, he wanted the ability to extend slavery into the Mexican Cession. You may recall that whether slavery could be extended into the Mexican Cession was a huge issue in the 1860 election when Lincoln was elected. Davis was also aware of the strategic importance of the Southwest, and as Franklin Pierce's Secretary of War, was a supporter of the Gadsden Purchase in 1853. This brings us back to the question posed at the beginning of his paper. Why did Davis authorize the invasion of New Mexico, particularly in view of Davis's responsibility to use the South's scarce resources to prosecute the Civil War to a successful conclusion in the vastly more populous and important parts of the country? My view is that Davis was one of those who felt that the Compromise of 1850 cheated Texas and the South of New Mexico and additional slave territory, and he was still smarting over this loss despite the passage of time. Therefore, extrapolating from all the foregoing, I think it's fair to conclude that Sibley's pitch to bring New Mexico into the Confederacy was very meaningful to Davis. The opportunity Sibley presented to conquer and occupy New Mexico and thereby to fulfill the South's dream of a slave-based empire extending to the Pacific, together with the minimum investment that the Confederacy would have to make in the campaign, is ultimately why Davis authorized Sibley's expedition to conquer and occupy New Mexico, despite the plan's alcoholic author and his starry-eyed goals for the campaign. Thank you very much. so much, Henry, for that really informative, enlightening talk on the Confederate invasion of New Mexico. Um, we're ready now to take any questions from our wonderful Facebook audience out there. Go ahead and put any questions that you have for Henry into the comment section. So Henry, I'm sort of wondering, and you may have already answered this, um, you mentioned Fort Union a lot yeah. and how imperative Fort Union was to the cause on either side. Do you have any idea how many numbers of soldiers at the at the onset of the Civil War left um, having Confederate sympathies, sympathies? How many left Fort Union, and and did that leave Fort Union in a place where they were sort of like a sitting duck? If if the invasion hadn't been stopped at the Battle of Glorieta, would it have been possible to take Fort Union? Um, well, the the. 
the Union troops that left uh, for the Confederacy were mostly officers. So that, that officer corps was really what the Confederacy wanted, as opposed to the enlisted men, because the Confederate officer corps were all, or the Union officer corps, they were all West Point uh, trained, or most of them were. And that's what uh, the, the, uh, the Confederacy lacked, that, that cadre of leadership. So it, there wasn't uh, a wholesale uh, uh, abandonment of the Union Army by Union troops. There were, it was a select group of, of mostly officers. Now, in terms of what would have happened had, uh, had uh, Sibley uh, lost the Battle of Glorietta, um, that's a very good question. I think that there, uh, because when the Union troops, that were mostly Colorado volunteers, uh, came south from Colorado to fight the Battle of Glorietta, they went through Fort Union. And the colonel of those troops was a man by the name of Slow, spelled S-L-O-U-G-H. Uh, when he got to Fort Union, he uh, discovered that he outranked the commanding officer of Fort Union. Um, and Canby, by the way, was in the south. He was still at Fort Craig. So he told the, he told the uh, commanding officer there, a guy, a guy by the name of Gabriel Paul, that uh, I, I'm going to take everybody, basically, from Fort Union. I'm going to strip it because I need these guys to go with me uh, to find the Confederates and defeat them. So uh, he didn't take everybody, but he took most of them. And uh, so it would have been a, uh, it would have been a, t a tough situation for the Union had uh, Sibley's troops been able to prosecute their campaign into Fort Union because there weren't a lot of troops there. Now, the, after Glorietta, the Union army that, was, that fought there was still a viable entity. And there probably would have been another battle, I'm, I'm speculating, someplace between Glorietta and Fort Union, because they were still a, a, a force to be reckoned with, I think. Absolutely. I think you're right about that. I'm always so interested in that part of history. It seems we came very close to having a, an entirely different, yeah. different uh, history in our state there. Let's see, any questions coming through? I think you answered all the questions in your talk, Henry. I know that for me, anytime I was writing down a question that I thought I'd had for you, you'd answer it the next okay. couple of slides. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, and we are getting a bit of a storm here, so yeah. I imagine it might be a little hard to hear. It's getting a little bit louder. So I'm going to come and rejoin you up here, Henry. All right. Thank you so much oh, again for pleasure. your yeah. for your wonderful presentation. This is the second time that Henry joins us here on our uh, Golondrina stage um, to uh, to talk a little bit about the wonderful and interesting history of New Mexico. So we hope that we'll welcome him again in the future. Okay. Thank you so much for your service to Golondrinas and for live sessions. Thank you to our wonderful Facebook audience viewers. We appreciate you spending some time in your afternoon with us here for our live sessions. As always, we'll keep you posted on our social media pages about the next ones that are coming up. Um, we're very excited to be able to announce that we are opening to the public on June 2nd. So we look forward to having our guests back here on site with us. In the meantime, if you're interested in coming out for a private tour, just call Amy at our front desk and uh, let us know if you have any questions. If you have any questions for Henry about this talk, go ahead and put those in the comments and we'll make sure to get those, um, get to those. Thank you again and we'll see you all at the next one. Bye-bye.